Yes, yes, y'all. You are now listening to the show for blowing, and the show far as a ram's horns is blown to inspire the people to do their thing. And today, the show far is being blown to awaken the elegant rules. This is Full Show Health on Blog Talk Radio, and I'm your host, Show Far. And today, my guest is Yao Morris, or as we love to call him affectionately, Master Yao Morris. Uh, he is the author of many books, including including the Awakening, the Master Masculine, also the Oracle of Kim Sun Nu, the Return. But uh, just to give you a feel for the guest today, I met him back in 2002. And every now and then someone comes along, and if we're fortunate, if we maybe haven't fucked up too much in our life, we might meet someone who comes along and really just changes things for us and really sets us, uh, helps us to up-level and to, 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 to really change the course of where things are going. And that's what this gentleman that we have on here today is. And for those of you who are not familiar with his work, who haven't read his books and everything, first off, I definitely recommend going through and seeing his catalog, see, see which ones resonates with, with you and everything. Uh, but one of the things that I want to say about especially our elder uh, sisters and brothers that are here and embodied with us still is to recognize and honor them while they are here, you know. And inshallah, as the, our Muslim sisters and brothers say, um, which means Allah or God willing, he'll have many more years to be here amongst us embodied. But to give this brother his props and to really understand the wisdom and the knowledge that he is bringing to us, you can still talk to this brother right now, you know, and, and, and have deep conversations and everything. So that's just, if you hear my voice, hopefully you heard what I just said. Notice how the word heart has here in it. It has, it has ear in it. So anyway, with all of that being said, um, I want to welcome this brother online and, um, and get some of his wisdom to share with you all today. So, Master Yao, are you here? I am. All right. Cool. Well, thank you. Great to have you on again. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's an honor, bro. It is definitely an honor. Again, family, we're talking about today the, the elegant rose, um, and I'll get him to explain exactly what that is. But before that, I just want to give you all one little caveat or one little nugget to hold on to. When we talk about these things, we're not talking about gender necessarily. We're talking about feminine or masculine energies, which are in all of us to different degrees. So with that, Master Yao, what exactly is the elegant rose, like uh, this archetype, this personality trait or set of traits? Uh, what is it? What is? And I, I, I also the word elegant or elegance, there's something to that too. Why not just rose? Excellent questions. Uh, you have four archetypes of feminine energy. And each of these archetypes is a bank of attributes in the DNA that every woman is born with. And these attributes that are there don't necessarily come online. It's, it's just like uh, a woman is not born with breast. She's not born with teeth. Uh, she's not born with a lot of her attributes. They have to come online eventually. And so all of them can't come online. Is too many. And so she has to help to choose which ones come online and to understand why they're coming online. The reason that we are born is to experience. And the natural way that the experience should be is it should be pleasure. It should be joy. So in life, everything that we do, everything that we experience should be joy and pleasure. Of course, can't be by definition but if we don't have joy and pleasure as the center of our life uh, then we easily lose our motivation to keep going and are to do to do things that make the world better so the first instinct for the woman the first attribute the first archetype is the moon which is the maternal instinct and that is to give birth to things and to support it so that it can continue to live. The second major archetype of the woman is the pleasure principle. In other words, that thing, that, that set of DNA attributes that allows the woman to take ordinary things and turn them into extraordinary things. It's like when you take breath and you sing. 
So, you know, you look at a, a song, the difference between a song and talking is that's the elegant rose. If you look at uh, a dress and fabric, the difference between the raw fabric and the dress, that's the elegant rose. It changes, it changes its purpose. When you look at a painting, an artwork, well, at first it was just, you know, stuff, material stuff. And then it's rearranged, colored, put into, so that when you see it, it inspires the imagination. That's the elegant rose. So the highest aspect of that is orgasm. So, you know, I mean, there's a whole lot leading up to the orgasm. But the highest point of pleasure uh, that that humans can experience is orgasm because orgasm leads us to a higher state of being in which we can experience something similar to orgasm but better. It's actually taking us out of the physical realm and putting us into a level of consciousness that is really the upper tier of what humans can experience. So the orgasm is the ve- is the vessel, the vehicle that women use to bring about pleasure. And then when they are uh, doing everything that they do, they're using an aspect of orgasm. So when you are working and you like your work and you and you're constantly getting um, good production from your work, you have euphoria, which is an aspect of orgasm. Um, if you are stuck in traffic and you don't want to become stressed out, you can have a lower subliminal orgasm that's not a climax that's sexual, but it nevertheless, you know, and basically that's, you know, you're doing Kegels or you're using jade eggs and things like that to help yourself uh, pull your nervous system out of your brain down into the vagina and into the, you know, the autonomic nervous system where you're taking your focus away from the outside world, bringing it inward, and you're taking your brain waves from the beta brainwave state, dropping them down into the delta brainwave state so that the world outside is screwed up, but you are not. That's not your experience. In other words, what I'm saying is that this attribute, this DNA set of DNA attributes allows her to experience pleasure even when what we normally think of pleasure is absent. And she can do this not only for herself personally, but especially for her mate, but especially for all men and women. And it's like cooking. When, when you take cooking and you do gourmet cooking, that's elegant rose. When you uh, design a house and you have a balcony instead of a window, that's elegant rose. When you are walking a particular way, that's elegant rose. When you're dancing instead of just moving, that's elegant rose. And so all of these things take regular stuff, ordinary stuff, and they turn it into something magical that lifts us out of just having to overcome daily existence, and instead we are happy to exist. We are, we, we, we are experiencing something that's blissful, that's high, that makes living, gives it a higher value. That is the elegant rose. Wow. Hmm. Those of us in the family, breathe that in. Taking in a deep breath. Uh, hear that, you know what I'm saying? The word heart has ear and heart in it for a reason. Uh, let that, because uh, what you're getting at, what you're saying to me, uh, is that even the mundane things now become pleasurable or that the, the extra, that the ordinary things now become extraordinary or extraordinary, you know, and it can even get to the place where even just our breath alone can be so pleasurable for us. And so I, 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 I think that this, I understand why you're saying that this, this, this particular energy, this particular, particular set of attributes are so important really for, for you being, for, for our existence on this planet. 
it's so, so true. It's like uh, a lot of the stuff seems like it's not that important, but it's what makes life, it's what gives life a higher value. So you have four attributes in the woman. The moon brings life into being, sustains it. The elegant rose makes it joyful to live. Then the treasure chest supplies the fuel, the resources, and she's also converting it to a higher vibration. And the seated hawk is the control room, the control panel, allowing the female to go back and forth between the different archetypes and to do different things at different times. So the, the seated hawk gives her you know, full range control of her different archetypes and attributes. But then you can look at this at the next level. So then we go from the, the regular surface uh, uh, construct of the elegant rose, and, and we say to ourselves, why do we call it elegant rose? It's not just a rose. So a rose is beautiful just like that. So boom, a rose is like, okay, that's that's nice, a rose. But we, we didn't just say it. We said the elegant rose. And, we, and that's the best that I could do to describe just how fine this attribute is because it's not just saying that we're just going to be beautiful. Elegance implies a certain grace in being beautiful and being creative. It, it is that aspect of creation that's supernatural. So... You, you, you just, uh, you look at the way people talk and it becomes beautiful. You take a British accent. I don't really like British. I don't really like uh, English. But you hear some women speak it and it's like you just want to sit there and listen. You don't care, <laughs> you don't care what they say. And you're like, dang, that sounds nice. <laughs> and so that creativity where you take people and they can just do stuff. They just make ordinary stuff, patterns in cloth, um, the way your house is laid out, um, you know, uh, the way that that you just put stuff on your body. You'll see women in, in, in indigenous cultures, they don't have a lot of money, but they've taken paint. They've taken uh, plants. They've taken flowers, they've taken stones, and they've twisted it, put it in this, did that, and the next thing you know, it makes them look beautiful. And you're like, whoa, or it has use. So it's creativity. But now, when you look at these three bodies, the light body, the energy body, and the um, cell body, so then we're looking at a whole nother way of looking at the elegant rose. So it's it's, it's allowing a constant conversion of all things, all sounds, all material, all energy, into a pleasurable expression, allowing humans to endure evolution. Why? Because, you know, we have to have a continuous stream of time, and we have, a, have to have a continuous uh, chain of change. Those things are required in order for life to move forward. So we have to have change all the time. Things can't stay the same. It's always got to change. And we've got to have time. And in order to make those things worthwhile, in other words, getting better, more value, you have to have the elegant rose. You have to have something converting all of this mundane stuff into pleasure. Otherwise, why make the effort? What's going to motivate you? Why are you just going to constantly spend your life engaging and overcoming obstructions? No, it won't work. You have to have a facility that makes this worthwhile, that gives it value, that makes you want to do it. That's the elegant rose. And so when you look at this, it's basically from a light body level, it's converting all things that are mundane to pleasure so that the vibration of it can rise. It's constantly taking everyday stuff and making it extraordinary and as part of a process of humans evolving into higher and higher and higher consciousness. And so it, it sometimes escapes us, but a lot of times it's not just books that evolve us. It's not just classes. 
It's not just religions. In fact, religions sometimes fail miserably at the evolution of humans. It's the creative faculty being turned to producing higher value to our every day, every minute of time that we spend on the earth. We would much rather live in a world with poetry and good movies and dancing and singing and good-looking people and smells that are pleasant and walking on pleasant surfaces and cloth on our bodies that looks good, looks you know regal, looks whatever, than the opposite. Of course, life can't be, you know, a Disney movie all the time, but nevertheless, we want to be in a posture where we're constantly aiming up. We're constantly aiming up. That is the light body aspect of the elegant rose. Mm -hmm. Wow. Powerful stuff. Really powerful. I mean, you know, the whole idea of you know, pleasure, you know, being something that helps to, com- you know, as for the conversion of this material well, uh, world or realm, you know, the mundane, for the, for the sake of evolution. And like you were saying, without that zest or zeal for life, uh, then, you know, on this little, this third rock from the sun, why, why, why go through some of the things that we go through if, the, if there isn't that carrot? at the end of the, the, the stick or whatever, you know? So it makes sense even from an evolutionary standpoint that pleasure is very important and that that factors in there and everything. Um, yeah, wow. I, I, I feel like, uh, you know, the word heart also, it has, uh, you, you, can, you can also get the word heat from it and associating love with something that raises, you know, the heat of us or the passion and everything of things. From what what you just said, it makes it makes sense too that that love act, act, uh, acts on us in that way that causes us to to uh, want to be here and want to fight through some of the things and and some of the pains of life and everything in order to again have the pleasure or whatever. So, uh, and I think and you spoke to this in the book that that is I think the way you put it was that is a, a instinct for that satisfaction or whatever. Um, and one thing I wanted to speak on, uh, Master Yao, is how in our culture, you know, um, you know, we could, oh, that's what you were saying that uh, there's an instinct uh, that that is satisfying, satisfying to the to the womb being or the woman to be perceived as being beautiful. That that's instinctual. So I want you to speak to that part, and then the second part to that, if you can, is how anti-social media or social media I like to call it anti-social media. Um, which puts the emphasis on me via um, how that plays into, like, um, that whole thing of wanting to be perceived as being beautiful. Well, you know, when I was in my 30s, I dated a lot of attractive women, you know. So I was out with a woman, and she had on just this marvelous um, top and bottom, and a lot of cleavage was showing. And I spent a lot of time looking at it. <laughs> and so a couple of times she's like, a couple of times she's like, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm admiring your breast assistances, and you know that's a hobby of mine." <laughs> and she was like, "That's, you know, that's so." <laughs> I forget the word that she used, but she's like, "That's so, you know, so rude." And so I was like, "No, the main reason I wanted to spend money so that you could eat is so that I could look at your breast assistances while you're eating." <laughs> You know, that's my main entertainment today. Of all the things that's happened to to me today, you know, that's my entertainment. That's my purpose for living. And so I was like, you just have the nicest looking breast. So she was kind of pleased and kind of not pleased. She's like, okay, uh, you just want me for my body. I was like, well, yeah, (laughs) I'll take more, you know. I'll take more. I'll take your brain. I'll take your personality. I'll take all the other stuff. But if all you want me to get is your body, I'm happy with that. So, and and you know, I'm just happy looking. So that was a comedian talking about, um, uh, you know, he was sitting, he was posting up in the mall outside of uh, Foot Locker, 
looking at the women trying on tennis shoes. <laughs> and he said, you know, he wasn't trying to be creepy. <laughs> he, 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 he didn't have any motivation of trying to get their phone number <laughs> or nothing. You know, he just, he just liked watching them try on the shoes. So I'm just saying that um, I remember, you know, looking out on a mountainside with ravines and glens, and there was a little bit of snow at the very top, but most of it was green, brown, all these different colors and flowers. It was breathtaking. And I stopped, and I just spent about 15 minutes just admiring it, the beauty of it. That's elegant rose. And so if you see a woman and she's all dressed up nice with earrings and everything, hair all done, you can just... It doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be sexual. You can just look at that and be happy. That's motivation to live. For me, I mean, you know. <laughs> and so I tried to explain to her that, you know, part of life is just, you know, you you just you just you're not necessarily, you know, you just you just happen to be beautiful and nice to look at. Um, lack of valley. You know, like art, like whatever. And so, um, I mean, I I don't like men sexually, but I got to the point in my 30s where I could look at men and see that they were handsome and be okay with that. You know, right. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm, I'm not trying to... I'm not trying to talk to you, definitely, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I have to get past this place where I sort of ignore the beauty of men. I mean, men can be handsome. And so right. I don't have to have sex with every woman whose breast that I admire. That's not, that's not how the game is played. And my point to her was, you know, um, happiness to some extent, is looking at the pancakes before you eat them <laughs> and smelling them and being, and being hungry. I mean, I mean, just think about it, ma'am. When I was little and my mom cooked pancakes Saturday morning, we rushed in there and sat on them like barbarians. <laughs> we just, she could hardly get them out of the griddle, and we were, we were just turned into the pancakes Dessert was flying everywhere. My brother was stealing my pancakes if I looked the other way. And my mother was constantly hitting us with the spoon, you know, in a nice way, in a, in, in a, in a playful way, like behave yourself. <laughs> but we were a little, you know, we were little table gangsters. And then, you know, I, I remember it was a white guy I was sitting at the table with, and he was just looking at his food, <laughs> and he wasn't eating. And I was like, what's wrong with you? And he was like, you know, you need, you need to just stop and smell the food. Look at this table. Look at the silverware. And he had such reverence in his voice. He had such, you know, he was just like in a whole nother rapture. And then I stopped and looked at the table. And I was like, you know, the guy's right. This is beautiful. It smells beautiful. It looks beautiful. The, the presentation is just beautiful. And then, you know, I cut into something and ate a piece, and it was delicious. But half of the enjoyment, according to him, was just being hungry and having the food in front of you and anticipating what was going to happen. And he was like, you know, if you just eat and stuff yourself, you're missing half the experience. So I think that in our society, we have gotten... You know, we've gotten to this place where women feel powerful because they're attractive. I think that's so dangerous. You know, it's like uh, the first time, you know, you see someone riding around in a Mercedes that's beautiful, and they feel that they're better than all the people that don't own one because they have one. That's, that's mm -hmm. bad. Mm -hmm. And so... I, I remember, you know, another white guy, right? Uh, he had an uh, antique Mercedes. I think it was 1958. 
I don't remember the details, but a lot of people were afraid to go up to his car. He was in the hood. I don't know what he was doing there. I don't care. But I went over to his car, and I said to him, I would just like to look at your car. And he, he nodded his head. He didn't say anything. He probably had his gun. <laughs> he probably had his gun. <laughs> like, like, right. This guy gets out of hand. You know, but he was smiling after a while because I was just looking at the car, you know, for about 10 minutes. And I didn't touch it. I just was walking around looking at it, you know. And he was like, you want me to open the windows? So I said, would you please? So he let his windows down. And so then I was peeking my head, and I, I tried not to touch the car, but it was so beautiful. And after a while, we just sat on the sidewalk talking about his car, you know. And, and then I left. I didn't, I, was, I didn't want to steal the car, you know. I, I didn't want to do anything to the car. But I just thought it was nice that somebody had preserved a 1958 Mercedes, and, I mean, it just was a beautiful, beautiful thing. So I, I think that it's evil when we take pleasure and turn it into power and spoil it. I, I think that, you know, we have to encourage young girls to be proud of their beauty, but not to get into the whole ego aspect of it. It's like, and we got to retrain men that it's beauty is not something you have to possess. You don't, you don't got to touch it to like it. Um, I mean, when the guy saw that I wasn't going to touch his car, and he he started to understand, okay, this guy, I was dressed in a suit, so he probably figured, okay, he's not, he's not a poor guy that probably, you know, because I. You know, a few years after that, I bought my own Mercedes. But I'm just saying that there there are things on the earth that are beautiful, that are that bring joy. You know, people playing the violin and stuff like that. And it doesn't have to be a way. It doesn't have to be something. The elegant rose is just gonna. It just makes life gives life higher value. We need to accept that and keep it moving. And support that, you know. Support beautiful women. I don't hate them. I don't hate on them. And I just like looking at them, being around them, smelling them. Um, and I try to, to myself bring some type of value, use my creativity to bring some type of value to life, to bring something that makes people's lives have a greater quality, whatever. I try to honor the elegant roles in that way. And that's why we use the word elegant, because it's not just, it implies grace, it implies charity, it implies love, a spiritual love, when we're investing life with value and we're not just trying to um, consume it. Does that make sense to you? That makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, makes a lot of sense. And, you know, the, the, the whole grace and refinement, of life that you're speaking to that that's one of the functions of this set of attributes you know that we call it, that you're you know calling the elegant rose and uh, so I, I get that and then also um you know in your book you talk about how that there's a harmony of form and function and that you know the elegant rose is in resonance with the key light the key life vibrations so i feel like that's what you were just speaking to as well Um, you know, um, when you see guys oh, play basketball, uh -huh. um, the ones that are good, <clears throat> some some people in the school system did not like the fact that the guys, you know, were often practicing without their shirts because, you know, the, 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 the girls in the school would stop <laughs> and they would try to find a way to get into the gym and watch the guys playing basketball when they weren't supposed to be. And I think, you know, at first you want to be jealous of the guys that had really good physiques. I mean, I had a decent physique, so I wasn't that jealous. But, you know, I, I guess as, I, as life goes on, you learn to appreciate why. It's like that's natural. The, the girls want to see the guys with no shirts. And so... It's such a simple thing. It doesn't cost anything for guys to be playing basketball with no shirts and girls liking it. 
Um, I mean, we got so much negative stuff going on. We got so much, um, you know, evil and war and famine and drought. We really need to learn how to appreciate the free gifts that are there and, and allow it to uplift us. That's the elegant rose. That makes a lot of sense. That, that, that again, you know, keeps us here and keeps us rooted in wanting to, to, to better this, uh, this life, you know, uh, and that's how life itself can keep going on. So that makes total sense to me. And you spoke earlier about reprogramming men or whatever um, to, to, to change some things there. Uh, and you talked also earlier about trance. And I know in the book you also used the word in, that, that the elegant rose intoxicates men. Um, what is that about and, and why is that? What, what is, when you talked about the three bodies earlier, the three, the three uh, bodies and everything, uh, what is the purpose of this trance and intoxication? So there's a female side to that and there's a male side to that. So first and foremost, the elegant roles, you know, can be used with any of the other archetypes, the moon, the uh, seated hawk, and the treasure chest, and that's part of her role. So young girls need to know that their attractiveness, their sexual attractiveness, is not just sexual. So what do I mean by that? Um, <clears throat> there are different brain, wang brain wavelengths that you can, that a woman can put a man into different levels of trance and they have different purposes. So the, the lower the brain wave length, and I'm talking about the, the beta length brain wave state, the delta, the theta, the gamma, all, all of those things are what I'm talking about. The, the, the longer the distance between the peaks, in other words, the lower the brain wave length, uh, like, in other words, delta is lower than beta. Beta, you're mainly into the top part of the brain, the cortex, and the outer periphery of the brain. And the more you get into the core of the brain and you start dealing with the pineal and the hypothalamus and you get down into the reptile brain, the, the, the more you're getting into the lower bandwidths the deeper the, the the experience of pleasure can be, especially orgasmic pleasure. When you're looking at clitoris stimulation and penis stimulation, you're mainly looking at cortex uh, activity in the brain. By the time you get deep into the core, into the the womb, into the vagina, <clears throat> into the prostate, into the inner parts of the man, you're getting into, you're moving out of the beta brainwave state down into the delta. And so this is what, we, what young girls when they're teens should be taught, how to do it and why. So it changes the neurochemistry of the man. It's, we're talking about the dopamine. We're talking about the adrenaline, epinephrine, or whatever you want to call it. We're talking about, you know, all of those um, hormones that, you know, um, that drugs try to mimic. That's what drugs do when you're looking at uh, LSD and, and things like that. They're trying to mimic, you know, certain brainwave states. So the woman intoxicates the man by causing him to generate neurochemicals in a certain pattern that go and stay and activate certain parts of his brain. And so the first four months of a relationship, men are made to be intoxicated by the woman. So it lasts about three to five months. And so every time the man sees the woman, um, he's intoxicated. And it's very easy. It's like if, if, she, if she really doesn't have to do much, it happens pretty much automatically. She, she really has to mess it up for it not to happen. But the man starts secreting all of these neurochemicals and they go into his brain and they intoxicate him. And they allow him to be programmed by her for pleasure. So after four months is over, after he's experienced her for about three, four, five months, then the, the brain 
does what it does to everything. It takes it out of the uh, immediate, like it's new. It's not new anymore. The brain creates brain dendrite patterns to mimic that experience, and it passes it, his file, his brain file connected to her, down to the reptile brain and the and the um, the pawns and other parts of the brain, and it becomes a program, and it does not cause him to secrete the neurochemicals it used to, and he has a, a better. He doesn't go into as deep of a trance. It doesn't program him as much, and this is natural. So women have to learn during that first four months when it's so easy to intoxicate the man that she can program him, and she's supposed to program him. And then when he when he takes her when he changes and she's no longer new to him, <clears throat> if she's properly programmed him, then he will <clears throat> transfer her file into the secondary stage where he doesn't produce the neurochemicals as much as before. And that's normal. And so a lot of women, after he stops being like super excited every time he sees her, they get depressed. They get disappointed. They're like, dang, I'm, I wore a new outfit and he doesn't, he's not, he's not, he didn't get a heart on as soon as I walked in the door. But what, if you, if you spent your time properly, and you programmed him during that vulnerable point, then when you need for him to respond to you as he did when he was intoxicated, there's a triggering mechanism to cause that intoxication to flash back again, and you can have that same experience. And then after that, he goes back to brain dendrite pattern. So what's a brain dendrite pattern? When you tie your shoe for the first time, it's a new experience. You got a whole bunch of neurochemicals being released because you got to figure it out. It's a, it's it's your cortex brain is doing it. You're in the beta state, right? And then after you do it like four or five times, the brain starts to develop dendrite programs because the brain says, "I don't want to spend 15 minutes tying my shoelaces." <laughs> it it constructs these brain dendrite programs, and after you've done it a couple of months. It's automatic. This is what I'm talking about. It's the same thing with the woman. The first time the man sees the woman, he's like, wow, whoa, my God. You know, it's like, and he's intoxicated. A year into the relationship, <laughs> that's not what he says when he sees her. It's <laughs> like, okay, she's, she's, she's more of a, it's more of a normal thing. Even though she, she looks as good as she looked a year ago, he doesn't have the intoxicated reaction. That's normal. And so young girls need to learn how to program men. They need to know what the neurochemical situation is that they're creating and how to use that so that both of them are happy. And today, that, that's not really taught to young girls. It should be. Um, <clears throat> from the other side of it, you know, we see that that men – Oftentimes, you know, spend time in the beta brainwave state with the woman trying to talk to her. And they find that difficult and they find that it doesn't do anything for the woman. And they need to understand that it's better not to talk so much in certain stages, but to act and to just be and to allow yourself to be intoxicated. And then after the relationship progresses into the secondary stage, the man understands the triggering mechanisms and he also gets the woman into her uh, brain dendrite patterns. He understands that. And he understands that the best type of communication with a woman from an entertainment perspective is nonverbal. And if you are going to be verbal, it should be elegant role style. In other words, like poetry or like rap or like um, something that's not just talking because talking is boring to a woman. And so it needs to be catchy. It needs to be entertaining. And 
Laughter and comedy falls into that, that category too. So that men need to understand and be taught that, you know, women are supposed to use you. That's part of the, the landscape. And you, you need to know when to stop her, when she's doing something corrupted. So when women are using you, and it's, no, it's not a positive thing that they're trying to do, men need to recognize and be taught, okay, then stop, stop feeding into that. If the woman is tr- putting you into trance for negative reasons, block it and get out of there. Uh, that's the short version. There's a lot more to it. And that's part of what we talk about in the high value relationship course. Wow. So many gems in there for, for you fellas listening, you know, this game in there, <laughs> you know, that the act and, and the nonverbal, you know, and, uh, you know, the poetry of, 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 of all of that and everything. And, and for you uh, ladies and stuff as well, so many gems in there. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you here as we closing out, um, I know you spoke about the, the young girl and, you know, her place of, uh, like, in a normal, non-insane uh, society, uh, you know, the young girl would actually have permission for pleasure when she's young. But, you know, we're, we're healing the world. So right now the way it, the way it works is that a lot of times – these faculties, when they're trying to come online, these attributes, when they're trying to be downloaded into into our being here, they get inhibited. And you know, drug. And you spoke to this a little bit earlier. Drugs, you know, the, the Molly or weed or uh, these different things, um, alcohol, cigarettes. Uh, these are all things that you know can play out. One, I just wanted to hear you talk on because it's kind of at a epidemic level, or whatever is trying to have the sweetness of life through literally sweets and, you know, um, how that actually ties into it. Because I think that that when you're talking about how uh, it it affects our being and everything, that literally we, some of, some of us, we're trying to substitute not having an orgasmic life or having um, pleasure with literally sweets. When a man or a woman experiences high-level orgasm, they secrete DMT, and they do it naturally. They don't overdose on it. And it's a better high than crack, heroin, or fentanyl. And so it has a natural purpose. It's, it's you know, you, you, it's uh, ayahuasca uh, secretes DMT. Much certain mushrooms do it. There's so many different uh, substances, you know, even um, uh, like, like, like tobacco and coffee can uh, in miniature quantities, okay? So, but the point is that young girls aren't giving permission to have a high-level orgasmic experience. So they should be taught that this is a goal from the first time they have a menstrual cycle because that's going to unlock so much pleasure and so much creativity in them. And so in order for this to be successful, men have to cooperate, and that's where the thing breaks down. If if the young girl at 13 begins to try to develop her high-level orgasm ability, the first thing that men want to do is take advantage of her, which kills it. Kills it. So th- there's got to be a different way that we approach this. It's absolutely necessary that a woman be put on a track to high-level orgasm. And it's hard to get there. If, if she's not, it, it, just, it just really throws off her whole being. Because most women today... You know, if you look at the orgasmic value table, it goes from minus 7 to plus 7. And most women are in the minus 1 or lower column today. They can't even have vaginal orgasms, much less a high-level orgasm. So uh, this needs to be shifted, and we need to start teaching this science and this art 
to the young girls and the young boys in such a way that, you, you know, there's going to be a, a, a lust for sex. We're not going to be able to shut that down. But there needs to be some deciphering, some code where we at least allow young girls some freedom to pursue this path without being subjected to molestation and rape and abuse and, and just take, being taken advantage of. Um, at least give them till 21 before you just all out try to just jack them. Um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to do today, and yet it makes such a difference in the development of the female because pleasure, most pleasure, so even the division of cells is a sexual act. When cells divide into two cells, the DNA, that is a sexual act. And there's a level of pleasure, you know, subconscious in it. But most of the things that are pleasurable, whether it's eating an apple or watching a sunset, involves aspect of orgasm. In other words, it's not an orgasm, but it's an aspect of an orgasm. And so the higher the level of orgasm that a woman attains to, the more value and the more pleasure and the more creativity all of these little acts every day can have. If she obtains to high-level orgasm by the time she's 25, then from 25 to the rest of her life, every last moment of her life is going to have more value in it, more creativity in it, more, more pleasure in it. And even when she's going through disappointments and stuff, they won't be as deep. Her mental health will be better. Um, it's just, you know, so many things have to change in order for us to get to that place, no doubt. It's not something that's easy to do, but it's something that, right. that, 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 that we should consider. That makes sense. You know, yeah, it's not going to uh, change itself or happen overnight, but, you know, uh, the things that you spoke to, you know, and I think that's, why rites of passage for for young people in general, uh, girls and boys, are so important. And it's, uh, you know, Ken Sierras and the, the the Hispanic culture and, you know, um, I guess uh, I forget what, it's not a bar mitzvah, but whatever it is, and for the, for the young ladies or whatever, um, and the Jewish culture, but bar mitzvah for boys, uh, these these cultures, of course, don't have even the, the deep, uh, meaning to them anymore. They're kind of just celebrations and you get some gifts and shit, you know, at this point. But, um, I think they come from the idea of doing deep inner, you know, ceremony, ceremony and spiritual rituals. Uh, the word spiritual has ritual in it. So doing rituals to bring on different faculties of spirit, uh, at a key time, you talk about that with your whole, uh, you know, second puberty, uh, protocols and everything. So really powerful, you know, uh, powerful things here uh you know we're at the time and i definitely want to you know um be mindful of your uh, time for you and everything so in closing out you know master Yow, is there anything to close out the elegant rose or anything else you'd like to say to bring it all together for the family yes first i just I, I once again want to thank you for having me on and i want to say to all the men and women listening that, you know, we're a long way from where we need to be. We're living in a dark age. There's no doubt about it. Um, and I don't, I want to make sure that it's understood that the comments that I've made previously are not meant to be judgmental. There's a lot of people that, you know, they're doing marijuana and porn because, you know, they just don't have a lot of options now or they don't see it or they don't know, or they haven't been exposed to, uh, to alternatives. And so that doesn't mean that they're bad people. Uh, if you haven't <clears throat> had some of these experiences, or you, you, know, you don't know people who are rolling like that, 
that doesn't mean that you're not evolved to some extent. That doesn't mean that you don't have some culture. That doesn't mean that you don't have work. It's quite the contrary. We are all, including myself, trying hard to evolve, trying hard to get better. And so you may be at one point, somebody else may be at another point. But my final thing is that you should always be pointing upward. Even if you're at a really, really low place now, you should always be pointing upward. It doesn't mean that you stop porn. It doesn't mean that you stop having sex the way you've been having it. It simply means it's your obligation to try to get to the next higher stage, whatever that is, and to try to sustain that, to seek out this knowledge and to allow members of the opposite sex to have some space that they can evolve safely, securely. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that we're all in a struggle it's not about passing judgment on people because they haven't gotten to this point or that point or whatever. My only criticism, what's truly evil, what's truly sinful, is if you stay where you are. That makes sense. You know, uh, then we, when we are doing that, we are truly anti-Christ. We are anti-life. Uh, you know, uh, uh, when we are refusing or uh, not not moving forward in the ways that you spoke to in an evolutionary way to the best of our ability. Uh, yeah, with that, you know, closing out, you know, Master Yao, that deep bow to you, you know, much respect, you know, to you and the ancestors and your your spirit guides for, for bringing through, you know, the, the knowledge and imparting it to us in a loving and kind way, you know, but, you know, still still giving us that, I like the, the flail and the crook, right? You know, the, 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 the queens and the pharaohs had, like, you know, sometimes gently, you know, pull, uh, you know, pull someone back with the feminine energy, and sometimes using that masculine energy uh, to to use that that flail to you know get your ass up and, and do it right. <laughs> so you you have a good balance of that, and I appreciate you. Thank you so much. For sure, for sure. All right, y'all family, and again, I'm Shofar. Uh, this is Full Show uh, Health on Blog Talk Radio, and I'm your host Shofar from Full Show Energy Work. Um, Y'all keep shining calm and keep that SEX, that Central Emotional Exchange, keep shining, keep evolving, and do so exponentially. Once.